Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about peace activism in Romania and Europe and the world. The uh, Our guest is Maria Sernat, who is the co-organizer and co-founder of World Beyond War Romania, a chapter of World Beyond War, of which I'm the executive director. Maria Sernat is also the host of a new podcast called Pacifist Barricades. She is also an associate professor of communication and public relations and president of the Institute for Media Research and Human Rights and lecturer at the Faculty of Communication Sciences and International Relations at the Titu Mayorescu University. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal for Politics and Law, published by the Canadian Center for Higher Education, and many, many other things. Maria, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Uh, what is the state of advocacy for peace, in particular in Romania? Well, we are at the beginning. We are at the beginning. Why? Because after 1989, a lot of international organizations focused their attention on LGBT rights, feminism, fighting domestic violence, and themes that are popular with the progressive left in the Western part of the world, what we called the global north. But to my surprise, and to many other intellectuals from Romania's surprise, no funds were given for peace. It was only recently that I asked myself, why was it? Because there were no grants, no call for papers, no debates on peace. And this is why peace activism is at its very beginnings. There is hope in the sense that even in Romania, there were student encampments. Uh, students were very sensitive and were very impressed by what, by what happened in Gaza. And since it was uh, live streamed and they are so active on social media, especially Instagram and TikTok, it was inevitable that they were impressed by the, the horrors that are live streamed every day and they organized spontaneously. Uh, at the same time, to my surprise, out of nowhere, some Romanians came to me and they said to me that they saw my article on feminism and geopolitics and they wanted to start a pacifist organization in Romania. I was you know, taken aback and so surprised, so pleasantly surprised to see that this is possible in Romania. Actually, a researcher called Florina Tufescu approached me and I was enthusiastic. It is very grassroots. And I told you, it is not top down in the sense that for the so-called classical progressive themes like feminism, LGBTQ rights, trans rights, um, queer liberation and all the rest, there are international organizations that are giving funds, awards, all sorts of uh, international financial support, but for pacifism, no. So it is quite spontaneous and, and grassroots. And we just started, we started a website, we started its podcast, Peace Barricade, uh, probably you could give the viewers the link in the description because I think it's very important to amplify pacifist voices and I will take the liberty to invite you also on our podcast to discuss why did you start this project, this very, very generous project and this very commonsensical project, I might say, that is somehow sidelined and marginalized, even in the progressive camp. I mean, you don't see too many pacifist organizations, and especially in this part of the world, where after 1989, I told you, there were many advocacy groups, many um, NGOs that were specializing in different parts, so to speak, different sectors of, uh, of uh, progressive thinking, but not pacifism. Yeah, that's very interesting because in the United States, it's pretty much the same. You have a lot more interest and attention and funding 
on all kinds of great issues that I 100% support, opposing racism yes, yes. and cruelty and discrimination of, of all sorts, uh, all kinds of domestic issues, anti-poverty, workers' rights, uh, et cetera. Uh, and you even have elections for officials in the US government, which in terms of its discretionary budget, the majority of it every year goes to wars and war preparations. Uh, and you have elections that never even mention uh, the existence of the world outside the United States. Uh, it's, so it's, it's bad in Romania for it to be that way, but it's, it's not as bad as in the United States. I'm assuming the majority of the government of Romania's funding doesn't yet go into war making. Well, not into war making, but unfortunately, Romania has a very sad legacy. I mean, Romania from 1945 to 1989 was a socialist country. But in order to advance their agenda, in order to implement all the measures that they thought to be right, socialists heavily relied on the security apparatus. Unfortunately, Romania was one of the socialist countries where the security apparatus was um heavily invested in and it took a lot of discretionary powers there is even this hypothesis that was first launched by two french journalists that um one of the main reasons why socialism collapsed was the fact that the security apparatus wanted to be closer to capitalism, that it wanted to be closer to socialism because a newly formed elite wanted to have more access to money and power and capitalism seemed to be more suited to their interest than socialism, who, for instance, in Romania, uh, did not allow you to have too many properties or kept a very tight leash on those who wanted to become billionaires and so on. And the newly formed, what we call the security apparatus elite, wanted gain some capital and wanted to get rid of this ideology that was standing between them and their business interests. And after 1989, we saw a very uh, monstrous coalition between the security apparatus and the newly formed capitalist state in Romania, which, which translated into the security apparatus gaining access to the state-owned resources on the one hand, and on the other, we saw them taking a huge chunk of the budgetary funds and invest those in all sorts of uh, security institutions. I think we are the one country where the secret services have the biggest ratio of employees per 100 citizens. I mean, you have all sorts of secret services. I think we have seven different secret services. Uh, and uh, a huge police state, if you like, but with this component of secret services very, very developed. So this is why the, I would call it the recipe for underdevelopment in Romania was based, among other things, on this element of investing a lot of money in secret services. And also the second thing was the fact that the newly formed capitalistic elite had a lot of connections with the security apparatus. Even today, you have this very strange mixture between um, capitalists, the newly formed capitalists in Romania and the security apparatus. And on top of everything else, since 2004, as a precondition for entering the EU, we were asked to become a NATO member. And uh, believe it or not, we thought and even think, still think very highly of the United States. And a lot of people equated NATO with the United States democracy, human rights, freedom, and everything Hollywood is so good in amplifying as uh, you know, a P the PR campaign, a national branding campaign for the United States. Romanians, I would dare say even today, mistake those very values that are part of the big propaganda machine promoting your image abroad with NATO. Uh, 
So we became a NATO state and a lot of our budgetary funds, they were going to the secret services and now they are going to military expenditure. I saw on Radio Free Europe, there was um, an article a few months ago, I read it, that in the past 10 years, we saw a huge increase in budgetary spending for weapons. And we are among the very few countries that actually give 2% of their GDP for military spending as the status of NATO membership requires. And President Klaus Rouhani is due to the fact that Ukraine is close to Romania, we have common border, right? Uh, he said that we should increase that to 2.5%. And in terms of being the obedient member of NATO, Romania is, you know, in the front seat, one of the most obedient ones. I think even Poland might compete with us, but we are very obedient. And uh, the fact is that Donald Trump said at one point that we don't give enough money. Well, Romania... <laughs> sets the record you know i don't know if it's straight or wrong but romania is uh there on um, in the front seats in terms of budgetary spending for um military equipment and i think there was i don't know if it was one person in the romanian parliament that voted against you know, this military expenditures in the past three decades. And there was only one person in the past three decades. He was accused of corruption and then jailed. It was Dragna who opposed increasing the budget for the secret services for the security apparatus in Romania. So you have now the picture. <laughs> so we are, but What's even sadder is that what's even, you know, troubling, more troubling than that, David, is the fact that Romanians still believe that NATO is a security umbrella that is necessary to protect us from the Russians. And it is the way to go forward. And if we want freedom, democracy, diversity, inclusivity, and all the rest, we have to give this money to NATO. It's a very strange situation where the EU demands that a country first join NATO because people, even peace activists, full-time peace activists, think mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. EU as an anti-war measure that got all these countries of mm -hmm. Western Europe to join together and stop fighting each other, only fight distant poor countries of the world. Uh, and yet, before you can join the EU, you, you have to privatize everything, but you also have to join a military alliance, a military machine that pushes military spending and drags countries into war. What, is, what does that say about Europe and the European Union? Well, to tell you the truth, when we entered the European Union, we were very enthusiastic because uh, in Eastern Europe, we have this complex, you know, of the poor relative you know, in the Far East, that finally is accepted among, you know, the very elite of Europe, the Western countries. And now we have the Dutch uncle, uncle and the French aunt that is welcoming us, the poor relatives, you know, and we are part of this select club and now we will live uh, like uh, French people do or Dutch people or Oh, German people, and this is uh, this was the idea, you know, that we are finally part of the so-called civilized Europe, and uh, a lot of enthusiastic people uh, were, you know, pushing for this idea, and it was sincere. The enthusiasm for the United States, for NATO, for Europe was sincere. I mean, believe it or not, of course, I was much younger then when I first, uh, you know, heard the European anthem, the European Union anthem, you know, Beethoven, the symphony. I cried. I mean, I was, you know, very, very emotional and really thinking that we were moving forward. It took me years to understand that, unfortunately, the European Union was... Um, 
the, this project, I still believe is a beautiful project, but I think it was hijacked by the elites and by people who want it, um, who want to, who want to make it function for corporations, for military corporations and the weapons manufacturers, and not for the vast majority of Europeans. And unfortunately, this is the, the, the main thing. Um, and, you know, those who criticize, unfortunately, the European Union are uh, crazy enough to come up with all sorts of conspiracy theories and not a lot of very credible rational intellectuals are able in Romania to put forward the serious criticism of the European Union without coming up with all sorts of ideas. Oh, these depraved individuals from the West are going to force us to become LGBT and they're going to take our children and make them all gay. And we should stick to our national values because these are the authentic values and we should reject everything from the West because it's all depraved. This is usually, you know, the criticism. And we who think critically of NATO and European Union are caught up between these very enthusiastic and I would dare say even brainwashed discourse pro-NATO, pro-European Union that doesn't accept any criticism and the ones who put forward criticism that are at best to conspiracy theory, not to call them idiotic theories, you know, because you cannot take them seriously. Um, and you know, at times, because um, ever since I was little, my parents taught me to detect secret services. If you believe it, this is part of our culture to detect secret service agents, to look at the way they talk, because they were a source of danger. And we are all a bit paranoid. A friend from, from Bulgaria told me that you in Romania accuse each other of working for the secret services between before saying hello and uh, because we were a bit traumatized by their power and their way of doing things and solving everything under the table and using all sorts of human weaknesses to to blackmail everybody and i thought at some point that the secret services they actually employ this kind of individuals to put forward crazy conspiratorial theories about the European Union to delegitimize, to delegitimize the rational criticism. And yeah. this is also a possibility, you know, that these people do it on purpose and they put forward this wild theories about uh, the European Union being this very depraved bunch of uh, individuals who want to make us all gay, you know. There are some parallels here. If I want to find an elected official who opposes continuing and escalating the war in Ukraine, I have to go to somebody who thinks the biggest threat to the world is either China or women who don't have children. And these are the people I have to stand beside uh, if I want to oppose the war in Ukraine. Uh, and when it comes to people who are semi-rational and able to engage in debates and discussions, if I say the people of Romania or Finland or Sweden or Poland should not join NATO, should use diplomacy, should use disarmament, should use crazy hippie ideas like unarmed defense instead of risking nuclear apocalypse, they say, well, what right do you have to say that? You're thousands of miles away with your food and your air conditioning and comfort, and you can't say that. Well, what do you what do you say in in Romania <laughs> to people who are afraid of the Russian military, which really exists and really invaded Ukraine and really can kill a lot of people. What do you say to people who are afraid of, yeah, of Russia? It, it's very difficult. And the only way to move forward is to criticize NATO and Russia. Uh, because, you know, there, I have some friends and they were, you know, so enthusiastic by the idea that uh, Russia is going to humiliate now the West and it's going to humiliate NATO and now NATO is going to be dismantled. And I was like, uh, are you sure this is necessarily good for us? I mean, it might be good at the scale of the history and maybe in perspective, but right now, unfortunately, 
the people who are pro-Russia in Romania are these conspiratorial types that want to go back to orthodoxy, banning abortions, uh, very wild forms of conservative thinking and conspiratorial thinking. So on the short run, it would mean that these people will come to power in Romania. Are you sure you want that? Because for better or for worse, even in cities, in big cities like Bucharest and other urban centers in Romania, we have at least a form of what we call civilized, you know, discourse in the sense that we accept human rights, so LGBTQ plus rights. Uh, we have debates on feminism. We just started in Romania a Me Too movement in the university, started denouncing those who commit sexual abuses on their students. And I think that all that would be gone. And there is a, a deeper thing here. You know, I was thinking long and hard about it. Why shouldn't we be in Romania necessarily enthusiastic about uh, NATO coming or going or whatever? Because even on a personal level, if you think about it, it's not good to, you know, to, to see your life in terms or your life in terms of um, we have to get rid of that. I mean, every, since I was little, we wanted to get rid of Ceausescu. Then we wanted to get rid of the, the next president, Iliescu. And we thought everything was going to be great. Then we thought that entering the EU, EU was going to solve all the problems. Then entering NATO was going to be fantastic. Then now what? Now we think that the magical solution would be for NATO to get out of Romania. I think we have to have a project, a strategy, a vision, because... We cannot expect, you know, um, magical solutions. There are no magical solutions. If we can form and we can we can't put forward a vision, a strategy for us as a nation, then these things, these events in history are going to, you know, come and go. And we are at the same place, you know, always victims and always waiting for a savior and for the next savior and always waiting to get rid of the boogeyman, you know, yeah. Russia, NATO, whatever. We have to be able to put forward some ideas. What do we want? What do we want? And I think it's very important to come up with these ideas because the enemy of my enemy is not my necessarily my friend. I mean, uh, uh, Medvedev, who is a very important person in the political life in Russia, said that Romanians aren't even a people. They are a way of life. And he said that like two months ago. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are people in high positions in Russia that truly despise us and despise the fact that we allow NATO bases here. And if NATO bases were to go all of a sudden, I don't think the landing for a country like Romania and Poland is going to be very smooth, if you know what I mean, because I don't think Russians would be very, or they would say, oh, we are not going to get our revenge on this opportunist who allow the Americans to come here and threaten us with nuclear weapons. We are going to treat them nicely. It was never done in history. I mean, I still hope, but it was never done in history. And we shouldn't be, you know, um, naive. Uh, at the same time, I think it is good to advocate for non-military solutions uh, to this very complicated problem that Romania faces and other small countries. Uh, it's very important to put forward our vision and to come up with non-military solutions because you cannot distinguish fire with gasoline. You cannot solve a conflict with Russia with more weapons. It's going to lead nowhere but to um, a catastrophe, a nuclear catastrophe. And we should be able to find non-violent solutions. A lot Who of knows? Maybe because... Room Maria, a lot of people think that the, the the horrific military actions of the Russian military uh, being what they are, they were 
provoked in a buildup from both sides and a major part of the provocation of Russia by the West was putting bases in Romania and Poland and elsewhere, bases capable of firing any kind of missile into Russia. And one of our major strategies as a, as a global peace movement is to, is to shut down all these US and NATO bases that are in dozens of countries around the world. Um, are, you, are you in favor of getting rid of these bases or you think they're doing something good? I am in favor of us first putting a strategy for ourselves and having elites that won't go from, you know, bootlicking the Americans to bootlicking the Russians. This is the most important thing. Then they have to go. Of course, the military bases are not here to solve problems. And I truly believe that they will amplify problems. But if we move from an elite that is, you know, the obedient, uh, you know, serf of the United United States, and we will have other elites that are the obedient serfs of the Russia, that uh, this is not okay. The most important thing here uh, is to be able to have elites that are responsible enough for our nation to put forward a vision, you know, for their citizens and not to look for the next boss, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because I told you, I would love for NATO bases to go away, but I would hate to see Romanian elites that, you know, selling our country off to another elites from Russia. We've, we've got just a, two or three minutes left. Maria Sernat, uh, is neutrality a helpful concept here? Should Romania perhaps try to be what Finland just threw away, and that is neutral and independent of anybody's of course opinion? of course this would be fantastic in my perspective i don't know how feasible it is with our current political class but i think it would be fantastic and a way to to move forward i believe in the concept for instance i wouldn't be so afraid of china because they think of uh, they speak of shared prosperity they have another vision for the world but russia saying that romanians are not even you know people but a way of life what can i say a lot of romanians are very much afraid and probably they have serious reasons to do so but nato and military bases i don't think they're a solution just add to the problem they don't solve it we just a minute or two left. Where can people go to get in touch with you, follow your work, help out, learn more, get involved, etc.? Well, for now, we have a new podcast that is called Peace Barricade, and uh, you can find us there, write questions. We will be more than happy to ask your questions, and I think we can provide uh, a different perspective from this black and white, you know, oh, we take down military, NATO military bases and everything will be fine. I think we can provide a, a deeper and more profound analysis, especially from a person and for persons that are living in a country that has a common border with uh, with Ukraine. Very good. We've been speaking with Maria Sernat, who is the co-founder and co-organizer of World Beyond War Romania, which you can find at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, we will have all the links up to her organizations and podcasts and everything else at talkworldradio.org. Maria, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure and an honor. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.